Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors. Um, so first item is, let me just check to make sure uh, right on this. Um, so we're going to have two public comments tonight, just so folks know. We're going to have a public comment at the beginning and then a public comment after um, a little further discussion on the budget uh, strategy. He's going to present us with some new numbers and some scenarios um, for us to get our brains around how we want the administration to approach crafting a budget given the constraints we're under. Um, so as always, you know, public comment is a um, very important part of the board's decision-making process. Uh, we value it hugely. Um, it is not a forum for back and forth. Uh, we don't uh, we don't respond in time, I, I, uh, which I know can be a little uh, can seem a little awkward, uh, you know, for people who come up and um, you know kind of watch us listen. Uh, but it's it's super important. We appreciate it. Uh, we also understand that um, you know some sometimes coming from the board involves personal matters can be you know, hard, and, and we appreciate the the effort and the time. Uh, put into it, and uh, you know, again, uh, we we consider it, and, and we ensure that that uh, it gets addressed in some manner or fashion. Uh, so again, we're going to have two periods of public comment, uh, beginning and then at the end. If you speak at the beginning, you are not prohibited at speaking. The second one, um, if we have, it doesn't look like we have a tremendous amount of people. Um, so I'm just going to ask people this time if they do speak to keep it to a reasonable amount of time, which I would say in the minute or two range. Um, I don't think we need to do a timer. Uh, but if you do drone on too long, I may ask you to wrap up at some point. Um, so if anyone in the room uh, would like to speak, uh, just go ahead and step up to the front. Otherwise, we can go to the uh, folks online and see if anyone online would like to speak. And if you want to speak online, it looks like no one's jumping up in the room. Um, if you want to speak online, please use your raise hand function. Um, and if you don't know where that is, you can just pop on video and, and wave your hand physically. I'm not seeing any takers from the um, online either. Okay. Um, with that said, we just had someone enter the room. We're just about to close public comment. We have a second public comment. Do you, are you, do you, okay. okay. Thank you. Um, uh, moving to the consent agenda. Well, we went, got from 6.30 to 7 quickly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You never know. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move that we approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion or questions? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, okay, I'll turn it over to you, Libby, for. All right. Share my screen. Okay. <coughs> okay. Well, can you, can you get that to go? Oh, that is, not is that me. the white computer? That is the Thank white, you. Yeah. There we go. Thank you very much. Okay, so here's the board update number three at this point. Um, we have a different looking chart to show the board and the community. This is one that the <clears throat> folks at the Agency of Education have asked us to use. Uh, use. So the columns on the, on the left that says description, general budget, that is a piece that the board is, should be familiar with. You've seen that before. That's the math calculations for the, how the budget is created. Um, the middle green column is our FY24 budget. That's the budget we're currently in right now for this school year. Um, after the yield was set and the CLA was adjusted for reappraisal, so this is what actually was on 
our citizens um, tax bill this year okay and then they've, they've asked us to show FY 24 so again this year's current budget if Act 127 were in place last year okay so these numbers are not true numbers this is as if Act 127 was in place so you see our general budgets the same capital plans the same the total budgets the same non-tax revenues is the same education spending is the same the equalized pupils is different because act 127 counts more pupils so that would be our equalized pupil rate with the new weights set in um, and then the dollar yield is also very different because if everybody's calculating more pupils which they are with the more weights the dollar yield we're drawing more from the education fund so the dollar yield decreases and so our tax rates if 127 were in place would have been a dollar two and a dollar four i guess a dollar 21 almost and a dollar 41. so this is a new calculation the reason why we're showing you this is because of this next slide maybe um this fy24 budget if act 127 were in place is what we need to compare um what we need to compare to get the 10 percent number to get the equalized pupil number that's the, those are the numbers we need to use and i'm sorry for those in the room i actually made photocopies of this for you but i left them in my office <laughs> so I'm, i apologize for not having them is it unlocked could i get it here christina will go get it. christina okay thank you i'm sorry about that thank you christina so the no, the green column in the middle there, FY24 budget, if Act 27 were in place, are the numbers we're using to compare FY24 and our potential FY25 budget now. So our FY25 budget needs to meet Act 127 goals is that we can add up to 31, or to our, have our general budget at up to um, 31 million two hundred seventy thousand dollars with the rev non-tax revenues that we have and we're underneath the 10 percent marker for increase per equalized pupils which is right here which i'm pointing to with my cursor yeah following so far so that's the number for our general budget or 31,270 minus the non-tax revenues so education spending could be around 26,399,653 in order to stay below the 10% mark. A reminder that if we go over the 10% mark, that could trigger a um, jury of our peers to look at our budget to see if it's excessive or not. Um, we, I, I would highly recommend that we stay away from that and stay under the 10%. Um, so that's what we can do in order to get there. Now it says here that the equalized tax rate would be 18.67. However, that equalized tax rate is what's capped at 5%. So it would be, if we come on under 10%, just a reminder that that tax rate would not be 18.67, it would be 5%, and the education fund would be making up the difference. Any questions so far on that from the board? Okay, keep going. That's okay. I don't need one. I'll be okay. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Christina. I appreciate it. So our needs to remain under the 10% increase per pupil, we need to lower our general operating budget by approximately $800,000 by either cutting costs or e increasing a revenue source. So in other words, now that more and more numbers are coming in, uh, to Christine in the business office, more and more numbers are getting real by the day. We actually need, if I go back to the last slide, we don't need $31 million to operate next year. We need $31 million, 800,000 to operate next year. Okay, so we're over what the 10% would be. As just to remind the board and the community that the budget season goes on for a while and Christina gets more and more real numbers as we continue. Um, things that she has to add in, things that she has to take out, things that we've talked about with the administrative team that need to be added or taken out. And so 
that need changes as of today, November 29th, that need is an additional $800,000 to um, what you see right here. So that's the number we're working with today for this slideshow. So it's an important number to remember. Is that, uh, is that clear for everybody? Yeah. Um, there are still many factors in expenditures and revenues that can influence this $800,000. It is not written in stone. It is not one that's a finished number. When we come back next week, we could have a, a slightly different number, but it is getting more and more real as the days continue. Yes, Jake. Um, so, um, and for things getting more and more real, do we know what FY25 long-term weighted ADM is going to be for us? Is that on the last slide? Did you get that yet, Christina? No, we don't have that yet. Uh, so are we still carrying last year's number forward? Yes. OK. Which Thanks. is another thing that could change, Jake, because we have less kids in seats this year than we did last year. So most likely, this number right here, 1802.99, will go down a little bit. OK. But is there um, the change to how they measure poverty? Um, you know, with the yeah. indirect certification, do you think that's going to increase our poverty counts? It could. Or it certainly increased our numbers, so it could. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So tonight, the conversation of the board is another need. Direction from the board regarding how to do this. And before we look at the next three slides, I put this in capital letters. And yes, I mean to be yelling <laughs> for, via my, my text. <laughs> Please do not take the three following ideas as written in stone. They're meant to be examples for the type of direction the administration would like the board to provide. They are not, OK, let me go with idea two. Right? They are, they are just ideas for you to pontificate on and discuss and that you could pull from lots of different things. You could go off of these ideas, but it's just an I they're just our ideas. Jill. So the, the lowering it by 800,000 is to keep us at that 9.9. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. As of today, we are going to need to do that. Even if we get more real numbers, we will still need to cut our budget or increase revenue by some number that is a pretty big number. Yeah, and just to clarify, especially the, the bolded letters, you know, Libby, me, and I discussed this. I mean, we three, I think, feel very strongly that in order to be responsible and not gamble with other people's money, that staying below the 10% is the responsible thing to do, and mm -hmm. it's in compliance with the law, and it's the policy that's been set, whether we, we like it or not. Um, and we also think it's, it's doable. Uh, I think you know the only thing we do by going over ten percent is you know play taxpayer roulette with uh, some pretty big numbers on the table. Obviously, that's the sentiment of, of two board members and our administration. And this board could decide to do differently. I would caution the board not to, but I just want to put it out there that that these following options are made with the understanding that we do not want to blow past that 10% number and, and, um, and roll that dice. And can you clarify, the 10% is 10% increase in budget or 10% change in tax rate? Neither. It's 10% increase per weighted pupil. Per pupil's better. OK. You want to go back yep. to that one other slide to show the <coughs> highlighted section? <coughs> okay. Okay. Which is actually, I think, quite a bit less than a 10% overall in terms of budget. Isn't it? It's an 8%. Yeah. So it's the the number in the blue that's highlighted 9 point. I know it's kind of fuzzy for us here, Jill, but um, it's the number from education spending per, per equalized pupil. See it? Yeah. So that has to stay below 10% in order to not trigger the review, the tax review board. OK, so idea one, a reminder. So the pie chart represents the 800,000, OK? 
Okay, so the whole of the pie chart is 800,000. I do not have dollar figures in here. Um, I figured out the dollar figures, obviously, to think of, figure out the percentages, and anybody who knows simple math can do it too, but there, I've put it with percentages. A reminder that our general budget is 80% salaries and benefits. Okay, so this idea one in this pie chart to get to $800,000 or very close to it would be to cut salaries and benefits by about 65% to increase revenue. When I say increase revenue, the board should remember that we have already um, said that we are going to use $400,000 of our fund balance in the FY25 budget. So when I say increase revenue here, that's to add an additional amount of money onto that $400,000. We, uh, Christine and I figured it out today, we can't go really above another $200,000 according to policy without making some other decisions. Um, we could decrease transportation by about 7% and we could decrease the facilities budget by about 3%. These Just to clarify. 800,000. You're, you're not saying cutting salary and benefits by 65% of what they are right now. No. You're saying I, they would take up 65% of, of the, the 800,000. 800, yes, thank you. And then same for the other percentages. Yes. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? But it, so this is, you, there's an infinite number of combinations. Mm -hmm. But you chose this one. There are three. Okay. So there's three, but I mean, like, what, how do you choose 65.2 percent instead of 65 percent? Well, it's just the way the math worked out <laughs> with the numbers that we came up with for the salaries. So, so we have ideas as to uh, as to which positions this would be. The, okay. the administration obviously has talked that through. Um, and so it equals out to that. So to do, sorry, Red, to do idea number one, you need to cut a few positions and also increase revenue somewhere and also do something on transportation and facilities. Yes. And those things you're gonna say what they are, or maybe not. During your budget presentation they would, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. These are broad ranging ideas now. So these broad ranging ideas you have, you can, you're not doing it right now, obviously, but you could, you can find a pathway yes. and know exactly what, how, where that revenue comes from and where yes. you're going to decrease the spending in each of these areas. Yes. I and mean, not that we're going to do it, but this is a pathway that you yes. could take. Yes, but these on. are general buckets that we could take from in order to get to 800000 And how they could make up the 800000 Yeah. And Jake is right. There's infinite ways that we could slice this pie. We chose three to just give us something that is like, to spark the conversation, and then take the board is gonna take it from there. Cause like the next idea might have salary and benefits being a bigger percentage or something. It's kind of like you read my mind, Jake. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like you read my mind there. Libby, I have one other question. Um, in, when you talked about the fund balance that we can use and other revenue, is that included or not included in this? Increased revenue would be taking more from the fund balance to put it towards okay. and our... And that's where that came yeah. from. Yeah, more than okay. we're already planning to. Yes. So another idea for the board is that we could leave facilities alone um, and cut a smaller <coughs> portion of, of the transportation budget, increase the revenue about the same, and decrease salaries and benefits by 72.5%. The board could direct us to do that. A third idea would be to increase the decrease, <laughs> to further decrease the facilities budget by around 18%. We could make a large cut in our transportation budget by 28%. We could cut our school based budgets uh, by 4 to 5% and have a smaller cut to our salaries and benefits and not touch your fund balance. More than we would already plan. Right, more than we've already planned on the 400000 so not put any more from the fund balance in. Can, can I just ask a quick clarifying question? The percentages that are presented in these bar graphs are <coughs> the percentage of the overall budget or the percentage of, of change? The, of the 800000 that we need yeah. to find. Yeah, so where, where those cuts would come from? Yeah. So, sorry. Could you clarify for me 
um, what cuts in facilities or transportation might mean? So with facilities, it'd just be the facilities budget as a whole. Uh, so for instance, in, uh, I don't know why my cursor is not removing. So in this one where facilities is pretty small, that probably equates to about $22,000, right? So it means that we wouldn't do classroom renovations. Every year we do like three or four classroom renovations to get a new paint, new rugs, new that, that kind of thing. We probably we wouldn't do that for a year. You know, that's where that money would come from. If, you did, if we decided to do a larger cut from facilities, then it starts to talk about larger projects that are in the facilities budget. Committed funds or not like track? Are you talking track or are you talking windows? Neither, Neither actually. Yeah. Neither. They're both in. They're in different. Other. They're in different pieces. Okay. None of these ideas um, touch the capital fund piece, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> um, because we're protected by that five percent cap. If we come under the ten percent. The windows need to be done. The roof on this building will probably need to be done. Those two projects are major capital expenditures. And so we believe for the next five years, we should keep that capital fund in place and then use it in FY30 to save some money, um, but keep that capital fund going so that we can do those major renovations. But the board could say, actually, don't do that. Don't do that. You know, we could say rather than cutting any school-based budgets, let's not contribute to the capital fund in FY25. <clears throat> is an example. I don't know if that. I don't know if those are the exact same numbers. No, but, but you could, the board could make that decision. <clears throat> so, for this budget, we're looking at an eight hundred thousand dollar decrease in per people spending or however we want to say it. Overall or gender, general budget. <clears throat> um, did you guys come up with anything for the following year? No. Or, and yeah. so is there, is there a likelihood that there will be a similar cut for each year over the yes. next five? Yes. Somewhere in this ballpark. Is, is kind I'm of not sure exactly what the ballpark will be, but yeah. yes, the board will be discussing <clears throat> I think we need to get through this budget season, and then the board will be need to discuss a, a plan, a strategy for the next four years after that. <clears throat> but it's not, oh, it's not 800,000 from FY24. No. It's 800,000 off of what you were thinking a couple weeks ago. Of what we need to function as of right now. Your plan, your previous plan for FY25? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you don't know the, the exact projections, I totally understand, but can you remind me what the trends and demographics are and what we're looking at in terms of numbers of students coming into our schools for the Do you mean school? demographics or enrollment? Like number of kids? Yes. Um, so number of kids right now, the trend is that we're decreasing slowly. We're not de decreasing precipitously, mm -hmm. we're decreasing slowly. And so the the per pupil spending will slowly go up as the number of pupils slowly go Most up. likely. Yeah. Depending on the kids that mm -hmm. move in. Yeah. <laughs> and the kids we lose. And thinking about every year, we can pretty much guarantee that health insurance benefits are going to go up. Mm -hmm. And so far we've made a commitment for not just FY25, but FY26 as well, I think, Jim, yeah. Yeah. on our teacher, what our mm -hmm. teacher's compensation is. In the contract that, that we, we just negotiated. No, we'll be no, we 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 renegotiating. Okay, right. we'll be renegotiating right. next yeah. year. I'm looking over at Joe right there to make sure, but we'll be renegotiating yeah. next year. So, um, but we obviously want to be in a position to. Yeah. We would like to, of course, yeah. but but the, my point there being that in addition to pupils going down a little bit, our costs are going to keep going up, yeah. even the ones that we don't really have much control over. Yeah, and. Yeah, and by and large, the pupil count, the downward trend there is is this is a statewide mm -hmm. event. I mean, for a while, I think we were one of the only two districts that were either stable or, or increasing. Um, yeah, and our neighboring district, Y Central, is seeing a, a actually a much steeper decline. In the world. Right. And that that decline this past year was approximately. 
40, it, but that that's a bigger jump than is anticipated in the next couple of years? Or is that, that that's probably, about? It's probably pretty similar. Something it's similar. That's, that's, the, that's a small trend from your perspective. Mm -hmm. And another quick clarifying question. Let me, I think I heard you say, some, in re reference to the fund balance, if we were to increase by more than 200,000 of a draw, there's something about policy that impacts that, and, and that piece I didn't follow. Yeah, in one of the board's policies, it has a percentage of your general budget that has to remain, that your fund balance has to remain at. Um, and so I had Christina do the math on that today. Mm -hmm. And so in addition to the 400, with everything encumbered as it is, because that's what we have to work, work with, um, the board could add an additional $200,000-ish to that $400,000, and you would be at the policy percentage. With the, the encumbrances as they were three months ago? Yes. And is there any, do we have any projections? I know the per pupil cost depends on the needs of the students. I mean, that's why it was established, right? And so what's our direction in that? I mean, we're not a Winooski. So we're, you know, they're getting a lot of high payment for students. Where are we on all of that? Where are we in terms of our students' needs and what we're projecting our students needs to be, or where are we in terms of our in terms of the weights? Well, the weights are determined by who moves moves or is in the district. Yes. And so do, do you expect that to be similar or do you expect any big changes in that in one direction? You know, I really that? couldn't tell you. I, I don't know if I could predict that or would feel comfortable predicting that. I, I don't I don't know I don't know like Montpelier is in I feel like Montpelier is in a state of flux right now and I'm not sure how it will all sugar out right. because of the flooding has it been fairly stable historically yes our English language learners have a big impact and even just losing a few or gaining a few can can really impact people counts weighted people counts do students remain English language learners after they've been in the system long enough to learn English? Not necessarily. So it's based on their score on, a, on the WIDA test, which okay. is the English proficiency exam. And students fall in different categories in that. The most basic, you know, is that they need a lot of support from an English language um, instruction to they're on watch or monitoring, you know, because they've picked up enough English and they're, they're doing pretty well with that to they no longer need services. So just because a kid is multilingual, for, for instance, we have lots of kids in our school right. system who speak French yeah. um, at home and speak English in school, and they, they don't qualify as a multilingual learner. Yeah. So just the kids who need support with that instruction. I just wanted to do a little reminder of timeline and sort of process, and then it might be a good idea to open up public comment to see if members of the public have questions before the board continues discussion, I was thinking. Um, so we have until mid-January to vote on a budget. We're hoping to get a budget presentation like this is going to be, this is the budget now, the actual budget, not just pie graphs with big picture draft numbers. One. Yeah, exactly. Draft one on December 13th. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That's our goal. And um, which means that the administration could really, really needs direction from the board by next Wednesday on in terms of like, what are the big chunks? Where, what are the big buckets and roughly how much should we go for from those buckets? So tonight's the night as board members and to hear from the community what's off the table, what seems like the you know, most reasonable, and also questions. Like, Miriam, I thought your question about, like, well, what does that slice of the pie on transportation, what does it really represent, could really help board members conceptualize to be able to next week give the um, administration the direction they need in order to actually put together draft one of the budget. Yeah. <coughs> Brett. Um, oh, and then Emma had her hand up. Yeah, let's, give, let's give the board a few more minutes for questions. Mm -hmm. I board think board. that basically the initial impression of the impact of Act 127, whatever that was, 
now, five weeks or something like that, presented numbers to the community that caused a great deal of fear uh, and dramatic responses. Is it possible for you to explain the difference between that prediction that there was going to be a, whatever it was, $3,000 tax increase on a $300,000 house if we did nothing or we went over the 10% and we gambled and lost with taxpayer money, that idea, and then where we are now so that, the, you know, as we're talking about this, I feel like this is an, it's a challenging, it's challenging to present. It, you know, it appears that this looks like a 72% cut in salary and benefits it doesn't say of you know it, it doesn't say of the eight hundred thousand dollars I feel like it's really easy from the, from the community for people to look at this and still really see red lights red lights red lights ah, ah. Um, so can you possibly take us from where we were when we were in real panic mode to kind of where we are now with the with the I mean I know that's really tough that's a hard one to ask for but if it's possible to go from where we were there, which we're not at now, kind of, we still have a lot of worries for the next four years, next four budgets, but we're not nearly at that place where we were, I think. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I, I can give a little, I mean, as I understand it, you know, yeah, I think big things like, I think, you know, from Oxford's perspective, I think we are in a position where we can obviously have some time to think about what that means. And, you know, over the long term, I think we're going to have to have that discussion, and we're going to have to discuss it in the year. But something like Roxbury is not hidden in these numbers. Um, I think that's very fair to say. Uh, yeah, my understanding is, you know, kind of from a from the you know s kind of salary and benefits, we're, we're talking bodies. Uh, and it's probably going to be not replacing some people and you know, not making some hires for some positions that we have out there. And it's probably in the like, I don't know, the three to five, six range in terms of, of bodies. Uh, you know, transportation, I think it's anything from, you know, on, on the smaller end, the, uh, the after school bus to Roxbury, the one for, you know, for Roxbury students at MS, MS or MHS that participate in extracurricular activities. And while that impacts some students, my understanding is that the ridership is pretty small and it's like 25,000 for I think about three or four people. Uh, you know, and I, I think all these cuts are unfortunate because if that means that someone from Roxbury isn't able to participate in something that's really enriching their lives, that's a big loss. Uh, on the other hand, it's twenty-five thousand dollars for a low ridership cost or for the ridership bus to reducing busing basically just UES in in Montpelier, and and then the the bus that takes you know the Roxbury kids from MSMS to MHS you know at, during regular school hours. So and. Um, you know, from the revenue side, it's kind of the four hundred thousand dollars that I think we we're already planning to move over into the budget to twice that. Uh, the other, what's the other piece? Facilities. Facilities. I think that just means kicking some projects down the road, which which are going to have to it's happen. Anyway. Maintenance. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I think the other piece of your question, Rhett, is that when we started this project. When we process. started this process, <laughs> this kind of is a project too, but this process, um, Christina and I were given information about which numbers to use, and that information changed from one week to the next. Um, and when it changed, then numbers change, right? So in any budget process, our numbers are going to change throughout the process. We get good news, we get bad news, we get a mix of medium-sized news, we get all kinds of things. Um, but the first time we presented to the board, we had been told to use numbers that were very drastic to our budget. We got asked for and got clarity between that board meeting and the next board meeting to use a different number, which was the chart we showed you today. Um, so that is a major change. I do want to say, though, 
that as numbers keep coming into our budget, the original estimate was that we were cut, having to cut 1.2 million. Now we have to cut 800,000. Still a lot. That's still a lot of money. Yeah. And, and one other number change, too, just, just before I go around. When we came last week, we originally thought we were going to have two, 2 million of baked in costs. When we recalculated and kind of looked at it, it was largely kind of a, a salaries and benefits thing, just looking at where people were on our, our scale. Uh, it turns out we actually had a lot more baked in costs. So it was more like 2.8 million. So, so that, you know, that, that 1.2 million could actually be 2 million with the new numbers. So, so we've, we had our, our baked in costs increased while our need to cut decreased. I mean, I don't want to take too much time, and I apologize. I just, I think the original, the idea that there were these dramatic cuts that needed to happen was based on a scenario where, and I just want the public to be aware of this, because, I, you know, I've heard people have written, if my taxes go up this much, I'm going to have to leave Montpelier. Um, and that was based on a scenario that was pretty unlikely in the first place. And then we've heard things that, from Roxbury, I heard that they were closing schools in Stowe. You know, I mean, it, people take small bits of information and they get blown up. Yeah. And so I just want um, the community to be, to be aware that the most dramatic cuts that we were talking about for this budget cycle a couple weeks ago were based on a situation where we would essentially gamble, right? allow the budget to increase as it normally would without making any adjustments. And then the Board of Education would review whether or not our spending was excessive. And in that case, the, the community members would be responsible for all of the increase there. And that was never very likely. And so I just want people to, to be aware that, that that scenario was 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 very much a very much worst case possibility that is also part an important part to think of to, to guide our thinking because I don't want anyone to sort of and it's impossible to completely prevent but I think that the worst case scenario was always very very unlikely um, and now is much less likely but we still have a very dramatic problem over the next five budgets I can appreciate that Rob. this is complicated yeah, yeah. Right? And it's not it's not <laughs> This is kind of where we came to at the, the last meeting. It, it, the red flags went up because there were really frightening prospects out there. And what else can you or we do um, than be as transparent as possible? But I also want people to be aware that those, those were very, very unlikely scenarios that were going to lead to those very, very dramatic tax increases for people, even then and far less likely now, although we do have a lot of hard work to do. I think we received the clarification we needed in order to use the numbers that the agency was using and the tax department was using. We didn't have that clarification. Well, yeah, and we still have this situation that if we were to not cut enough and or put enough extra revenue in, and we were at, we did end up more than 10% in per pupil spending above this year's scenario using the new numbers, there is a chance that all of our taxpayers would hold the entire bill and would not have the tax rate capped by the state, which is why my encouragement is that we don't go there <laughs> and we just stick with, they gave, us, they gave us the instructions, let's follow the instructions, let's understand the assignment, as the kids say. So Emma had her hand up. So, uh, I mean, I struggle with making, you know, giving direction now on a one-year, a one-year projection, not taking into account the other four years. And so, I want to understand better, sort of what is likely to happen to these numbers next year, and the year after, and the year after, before being able to signal to the administration which direction we should head in including the thought experiment of what does it look like if we just present a budget that is, we have added nothing new except for these few grant positions that were grant funded. And if we go over by the $800,000, which would put us above the 10%, did we run numbers on what, how that would impact the tax rate? So I see 1.548 
if we stay under the 10%? Yes, we have run those numbers. So one thing for the board to consider is, um, and Christina, jump in here if I say it wrong, um, with Christina's uh, understanding, if 127 had been in effect last year, our budget would have had to be $2 million less to have the same tax rate yeah. as we did last year. Okay. So if you think about it that way, we're starting in a $2 million hole, mm -hmm. essentially, right? So we're adding, to our, if our tax rate was this way this year, we're, and the difference is $2 million, each year we're going to be adding to that to keep, and if we want a similar-ish tax rate, which I don't know if it will be possible or not, but if we want a similar-ish tax rate, then we're going to have to have a plan to continue to decrease that, <laughs> lower the increase over time <laughs> um, in order to do that. So if we were to put what everything in we needed the tax increase i mean i hate to even say this based on what you know just the conversation rat was saying because it it makes it more scary would be around 22 percent increase if um, we and that would be a 13.26 percent increase per equalized pupil so can you tell me based just so that I can compare apples to apples so the number that I'm looking at is one dollar and fifty five cents basically if we round up did you run the numbers on what that tax rate would be we didn't go all the way down to the bottom for that okay because it's basically like an 18.67 versus 22 percent yeah right but it's not because the 18 would be capped, capped at 5%. Five. Yeah. So yeah. that 18 would not come true. The ad fund would make up the difference between whatever the money is for 5% and 18%. So my understanding is that there's this trajectory out five years and that at some point we're going to have to see that bump, the 18% bump-ish. So that's if in the continue charts. continue our spending in the way, if we continue the same amount of spending. Right, so it feels sort of like a now or a later proposition. Like we either accept that, you know, we pay more in this first year or we're going to pay more in the fifth year, in 2030. Or we're going to cut our budget by an amount of money that nobody really wants to talk about or stomach. Do you want to give your three scenarios that you were giving to the legislators? Oh. Yeah, the way that the math works out on the broad level is we either, and we probably have to do all three of these things, cut cut a lot from the budget, increase taxes, or get more students in the into our classrooms. So those are the, those are the three things we, we have the next five years to do. Right. <laughs> at, the, at the very high level. Yeah. I mean, I think the risk of just doing that now are, are several. One, I think if, if we do it, more gradually over time, it's less dramatic to everything. It's less dramatic to the school system. It's less dramatic to the taxpayers. Um, three, it doesn't give the legislature any time. I don't think we can count on this, but certainly if we cut our heads off now, we can't count on it. It doesn't give the, the legislature any time to deal with this problem. They've got five years to deal with this problem now. There's many districts that are in the same place. And, and one of the, the big one of the interesting things of law is, is what the law is doing, and I hope the legislature understands this. It's not just putting our district in a bad position, but the advantaged districts are looking at this, this you know, drop in the yield, <coughs> drop in the ed fund, you know, and they're getting money for the purpose of spending more money on pupils. But some of them are saying, we're not going to spend any more money because this, this bump is going to hit us too. So we're just going to keep things level. So that way, you know, we don't have a tax hit either. So the law is very poorly designed. And we've got some smart people in the legislature who I think are going to look at this and try to put something in place. So I think if we, if we roll the dice this year with that, we could have a huge hit that we might be able to avoid with all time. I do find it unlikely that the Secretary of the Agency of Education would see a budget that has no additions other than the 
grant funded positions and call that unreasonable spending. So it feels, you know, the analogy is a gambling analogy, but it feels like a pretty safe bet that it would not be deemed excessive. I think that I, uh, I'm not going to even venture to guess what a secretary who has not been hired yet would say. In, in an administration that has not been education friendly. Um, they could be looking at some, for instance, which was mentioned yeah. to us by a legislator. Oh, the teachers received an 8% increase. That could be considered excessive. Yeah. Do we consider it excessive? No, we gave the teachers, or the board rather, gave the teachers that 8% salary increase. But that's a major part of, of this yeah. challenge right now, right? And um, so, but that could be deemed excessive. Because yeah. that was within the board's control. And Jill, Jill has her own too. Oh, I just real quick, um, I really appreciate how you have laid this out because it's not line by line, item by item, which starts to get really we start to get in the weeds. This is like very much suggesting the big picture, and I can I can easily figure out how much of eight hundred thousand each of these are. So I just I wanted to say that I really appreciate how this is written out, and I do want definitely want to put my stake in the ground that my position. I feel like we need to leverage that cap, and so I like bumping as close up as we can to the 10% realistically. I mean, we're still having to make a, an $800,000 cut, but I think we need to leverage that cap that is in place for the five years. Um, I think it would, that's, that's where I'm at. Yeah, basically, same thing. Um, the 5% cap, we really want to be in that group. Um, because <laughs> it provides some protection. The Ed Fund can, all kinds of things can happen. Um, Non-property tax sources to that fund can tank. Um, real estate, for some reason, could dive. And that, that would expose anyone who's not protected. <clears throat> so if you're protected by the 5% rate change um, year over year, it, it actually gives you some, some protection. And it's, it's, a, it's a super weird situation this year where you know, the disadvantaged districts actually may be advantaged because they're getting this protection, whereas the advantage districts, such as Burlington and Winooski, they're actually going to be exposed over the next four years to all kinds of things that are outside of their control. And the reason why you say that, Jay, and correct me if I don't have this right, if we, if our tax number came in at 4%, like right now it's at 18%, but if it came in at 4%, oh. which is really easy for an advantage district to do because of the amount that they could add, mm -hmm. um, then the five percent rule doesn't exist anymore. Right, they're right. Like they're, that, they that, protection that protection goes away. Is what yeah. you're they saying? Yeah, they don't and, need it. And you have to join the group in year one. That's the only time you can join. That's right. You can't join it later. Oh, and if you good. ever don't reach the five percent, you're out of the you're group. You're kicked out of the group. Yeah. So there is some weird stuff <laughs> in the law. Meaning we couldn't go over. We couldn't go over the ten percent this year without the five percent protection, and then next year decide to stay within. Correct. Yeah. Okay. We, we are not eligible for the five percent cap after we after go if, over it. if we go over the ten yeah, percent. It's use it or lose it. Gotcha. Um, can someone explain to me the? So I'm not understanding how we would have to cut a similar amount or or not spend a similar amount every year. Like, let's call it $800,000. So next year, wouldn't the 10% cap be based on this year's number? Yeah. And so why, why is it likely that we would have to reduce the budget by $800,000 again next year? Just I cost of living? $800,000, but because of cost increases, we'd have to decrease again. And pupil decreases. Yeah. But we've dug ourselves out of the $2 million sort of hole that from last year. If we, if we do it according to this plan, we dig ourselves out of the, the deficit. Why would we then be looking how, at how major? How we dug ourselves out of the deficit? By cutting $800,000. That doesn't get rid of $2 million, though. So, so we're going to be cutting until we hit a $2 million point, and then we would be sort of level funded with fiscal year 24? The way that you're speaking is in absolutes, so I worry about that, right, because I don't want you know, misinformation. We, I don't want misinformation yeah. to get out there. We don't know exactly what we have to cut. But the the two million dollar piece that I was referring to yes or earlier is from FY's twenty four budget is was twenty eight thousand six hundred eight dollars and change, right? right? So in order to have the same tax in, impact, 
from this year's budget, FY24, that number would need to be 26,608, right? But it's not, it's 28. And so if you think about it, going from 26 to 30 million is a $4 million increase, and we're still having to cut $800,000. Right, but our hole is now $4 million, yeah. not two. So the eight hundred the eight hundred thousand dollar cut isn't making up any of the difference that we quote unquote lost if if Act one twenty seven was in place for FY twenty four. It's not making up any of that two million. It's simply getting us below the ten percent. So it would be interesting for me to see, and I know that it's all hypothetical and based on a lot of unknowns, but it would be interesting for me to see at least one more fiscal year of like comparing what would it look like to move into the next fiscal year if like we're, FY26 if the 10% you know factoring in the 10% I just really don't think we could give you even a hypothetical other than it would be so hypothetical we don't know what the te the raises would be for the teachers we don't have an idea of who will be here and who will not be here it's, it would be very hypothetical mm -hmm. I mean simple exponential growth idea will tell us that our budget will continue to grow and we're going to, you know, we're starting in a hole. So basically what you're saying, there's a $4 million hole to dig out of over the next five years. Could be. And if we do $800,000 a year, it's roughly, it roughly gets us there. I didn't say $800,000 a year. I said we're going to need to think about cutting or increasing revenue across the next four years in some sort of strategy. In the, in the way you're working it out there, Emma, I think the uns, the implied part there is if the tax rate were to remain the same. Yeah. yeah. That's the, because that's the reason that we're make, giving this sort of like scenario of it last, this current FY24 budget needed to be, would have needed to be um, $2 million less than it currently is in order for the tax rate to be the exact same in FY24 as it was, as it is actually. And so the other reason that it's hard to do the hypothetical is that the tax rate is actually going to increase every single year because it's just a 5% cap. It's not a 0% cap that the state is offering us. If we stay below that 10% per pupil increase, we only will increase our taxes by 5% before the CLA. So no matter what, for the next five years, our taxpayers are going to see their taxes go up. We're just, the reason that we're focusing on this 800,000 for this year is because it's the numbers that we know that will keep us to a 5% tax rate increase rather than an 18% or bigger. And, and let's be honest, we have not raised taxes 5% for five years. And remember, it's not 5%. Board. It's 5% divided by the CLA. Before 5 the CLA. divided by the CLA. CLA. But so it could be even a little bit more than that. It could be more But than I think that. that's why, Emma, it's hard to do. I think it's why it's hard to figure out what you're trying to figure out. Yeah. Because it's not just that $800,000 is chipping away at the hole. It's If we did it every single year, it's more like when we look at this year, in order to be able to meet those rules that are in the law, that's why we that's why the eight hundred thousand dollars matters. So it's not quite we can't quite project out, oh okay, it's gonna be eight hundred thousand dollars every year for the next five years. We don't because we don't know it yet. Yeah, I'm not asking for like an exact number. Yeah. Just sort yeah. of like more of a like how Christina presented a graph um, a couple of yeah. meetings ago mm -hmm. and there was sort of this like projected trajectory of how it could what could look. And I mean, I'm happy to look at numbers that are very hypothetical just to get some sense because yeah. I feel like I'm operating at yeah. a deficit and that where graph I don't was have any sense. hypothetical. Mm -hmm. I was, I was yes. I was adding two million dollars each year. Come up here. We, we, they can't hear you online <laughs> if you're sitting over there. Yeah, the graph with the tax rates um, yeah. I was added two million dollars to the budget each year. Right. Just to as a rough really guess. Cover salary and, benefits, but. and we must have some historic data on like roughly what yeah, the increase Yeah, we do. Been. I've looked at that and it's tricky. You can stay right there. That's fine. So you can pretend <laughs> to pay. We need you. That's what she's trying to say. Yeah. She loves that I've gotten to know her better in the last two months of school. <laughs> so um, I have looked at that and it's tricky because we were in COVID for two years of it. So mm -hmm. the average is tricky. We average, I think, about 1.4 million additional each year to our general budget. Mm -hmm. 
without so, any added positions or anything like that? No, that's with what we've decided, what what budgets we made, which added positions and things like that over the over the last six years certainly, it averages out to be about one point two to one point four million a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we are also in a year where it's very well deserved and we're happy about it. The teachers have gotten a an adjustment more than kind of the yeah, yeah. I mean, we've usually we've usually had teacher salary increases in the you know three to three point five range, and now we have an eight percent increase. So we're we're more than twice what we've historically had. And Scott, Christine, and then, Christina, yeah, the yeah. health insurance alone, you told me that number today. Sixteen percent. I know, but what did it equal to for dollars? It was like three million or something like that. Just on the health. Sorry, I forgot. It's three point nine million dollars just in health insurance. Wow. Just for health care this year. Just paying health insurance. So much for that point of bargaining. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Scott, did you have your hand up, and then yeah. Jill has her hand up. Um, so I just wanted to to pause for a moment and and say to to Rhett, I'm very sympathetic to the the concerns that you raised. I think I think it's very. It, it's difficult because of all of the uncertainty, right? There's a lot of things that we're not sure of. We're trying to make our best guesses. And then there are other things that we're very sure of, right? Um, and I think it's important for us, and, and I'll, I'll throw myself under the bus, um, and, and say, like, it's important for us to, to choose our words carefully. Um, I think I was the one last time, or two meetings ago, talking about pitchforks, which, again, in hindsight, was poor, um, very poor choice of words, um, but but and not, I'm not want to point fingers, but to make us to make statements like um, you know an increase uh, uh, will will impact all of our taxpayers is is just we know to be incorrect, right? Many of our taxpayers um, are are cushioned by um, by the. Um, Thank you very much. But they'll still see an increase. It'll just be a mitigated one. I think that's important to say. Like just because, just because you have income sensitivity to your property taxes does not mean that it stays static. Absolutely, it's, it's, it's but it's an oversimplification to yeah. say someone with a three hundred thousand dollar house will pay an increase of X number yes. of dollars because there is no single amount that will will change. It's it's not based on the value of the house alone, and so it, it's more nuanced. And I think again, I I. And uh, we all can be very careful in, in the words that we use to describe the potential changes um, so that we're not setting up a scenario where, where we're misquoted by saying, you know, so-and-so on the board said that my taxes are going to go up by $10,000 next year. So-and-so on the board said that we're going to close Roxbury. Right when when I know nobody said we're closing Roxbury, yet that was a perception held by some of our, our residents. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's a challenge, I know. Um, and I know we're all balancing a lot of um, um, difficult and complex um, scenarios. And so, um, yeah, I, I appreciate it. And, and I will be the first one to say I'll choose my words better next time. Um, the, I had an, a question also. There are. <laughs> there are currently positions that in this year's budget that are unfilled, if I remember correctly. We have one math position that is unfilled mm -hmm. at the middle school. I believe that's it. And so I'm a, and you made reference before to to not filling anticipated openings and, and so I'm curious, like if if like we're talking about cutting salary. But we're not talking about cutting everyone's salary. We're talking about particular positions that may not be filled. And so, yeah, I think it would be helpful as we move forward to get a better understanding of when we say we're going to reduce X number from salary and benefits, that that simply means not replacing people versus that's cutting. That's not what I would say. That's not, I wouldn't say that absolute. Mm -hmm. That is a possibility for mm -hmm. some positions. There are some. We will fill the math position. We couldn't this year. <laughs> like, that's not a choice for us. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in the first pie chart I showed you, that number represents approximately 5.5 FTE. 
across three unions and non-unionized staff. And so it is not directed towards one union. It's not directed toward, you know, it's across yeah. our, our entire staff. And that's 5.5 FTE of people that would be in those positions if not for the cuts or it's just not replace not replacing 5.5 FTE. I'm not I'm not suggesting we have the answer tonight, but but for there me there are lots of scenarios. Yeah. So there are some scenarios that there are positions that the administrative team could say we could we could riff that position. Mm -hmm. For instance, the board has known since last last year that if the way enrollment looks at Union Elementary School, we have we will have one too many teachers there. So one position that's in that 5.5 is a K6 licensed educator because there isn't a need for it with our class size policy and thing that was known last year. We we riffed one 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 FTE last year there. We knew we were going to riff another one this year. So that is a position that is currently had right now, yeah. and it would be riffed. Um, there's another position in there that we could potentially not fill. There's retirement savings in there. There's um, other pieces we had in, in salaries and benefits. There's reducing some from a 1.0 to a 0.5 potentially. Uh, there's lots of different scenarios in there um, that the admit if we know the ballpark from the board as to like do this kind of ballpark pie chart <laughs> then we've got our priorities in place and we're ready to move on it because Christina is not going to have a whole lot of time to put it together so we've got our priorities lined up um, we just need the direction because it's eight hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money and that's the, the nuance that I, I love and so knowing that whatever 65.2% equals five and a half FTE that's the piece plus that, retirement yes yeah. and you know that kind of thing yeah those are the pieces that are, are the additional pieces that that will be really helpful as we get further into the, the budget well, uh, building process I think you can ask those questions tonight yeah I think yeah. Be a great this is the night time. to ask those questions so because you could go through that whole pie chart and go <laughs> what does this represent please yeah. yeah because next week we have to give the direction next week we don't have time to be like I need more information yeah but yeah. we also did promise the public we would open up to public comment, but Jill also had her hand open. Yes, no, Jill, and then I think we can open up. But, the, but just before I go, the, that's exactly. That's a great question. Like, when you think about the remaining time tonight, like, what do you need conceptually to come in and kind of feel comfortable? Like, you know, if you're going to say, hey, cut as much from transportation as, as you want because you've thought about it and said, you know, hey, I, I think, and I'm just, just purely hypothetical, this is not representation of how I think at all. <laughs> but I've decided that I would rather have middle school kids walk than take, you know, another teacher out of the class or out, out of a school. Um, you know, those type of things. Like, I am okay deferring facilities for a year if it means we have another year to have a teacher and kind of think about what that means. So, you know, think, you know, ask those questions so you, you can kind of get the clarity so it's just not little colored wedges on a graph. Joe. Yeah, that's sort of where I was going. I want us to kind of move on and yeah. start to actually give you guys, because I, I think, I think we, yeah. we, we know what, what we know is what we know. And so I'd yeah. love to sort of dig into this. And I found it helpful to translate the percentages into dollar amounts so I'm not thinking about it as, you know, like it's really easy to conflate the two. and. Um, I'm, I'm liking ideas one and three to my, you know, quick review. Um, I don't like any of this first. Yeah. <laughs> we don't, cutting is not the nice part of the budget, but in the one hand, I, you know, idea one sort of spreads the pain a little bit, but I'm not sure we would have continued money to take from the FUD bans, balance, similar to how the legislature had money in the Ed Fund, and so that's how our tax rate stayed a little lower last year, Well, that's gone, I think, or is about to be gone. So I don't, so that might get us through this year with less pain because we'll have that, but I'm not sure that's a five-year solution. So that's one question I had. And then three, um, you know, similarly, it kind of spreads the pain a little more. I really don't want, um, I, I think a priority for me personally is I don't want to cut direct um, instruction positions if at all possible. But I am very curious to know what cutting over 200,000 of transportation looks like and what the facilities, 18%, like what that looks like. No, but that being said, in contrast to the first one where there's the fund balance, 200 grand from the fund balance, if we cut transportation in year one m drastically, then that's 
gone. Am I right understanding that we're not going to then put it back next year and then two right. years? So like that would be a continued, I don't want to say savings, but it would be a continued change in our budget for the five years because we would be cutting that out of our budget this year and it would not be back in the future. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So for that, for idea three, that chunk of money from transportation, transportation's easy to think about because right. there's not many options there, right? So what that would represent is Roxbury Village School Transportation, the Roxbury late bus, not the bus to get kids to and from Montpelier from Roxbury, but the, the late bus and middle school transportation that was added in sixth year. The first one you said? you. The there's, village school. There's one that takes Roxbury students within the village, as opposed to the one that just goes back and oh, forth. Oh, OK. I was going to say, I don't know how we're going to get all, them all here. No, no, no. Okay. That, that, okay. that stays. <laughs> that, OK. That's okay. what that big green chunk so would represent. The village, the village route, the later bus for Roxbury students, and then all of middle school. Yes. OK. okay. So let's hear from Jake, then let's open up to the public and let's come back and... You know, I, I like might say, I'd love to hear what all your questions are before you ask for public comment. I don't know what the rest of the public would like to do, but that would give you more information. Let's, let's, let's do that. Let's, with kind of the note of like some specific, why don't we ask, why don't we ask questions, but let's try to direct our questions to like specific things you'd like to know about these pie charts. <coughs> to help can make a just get a, I mean, can Libby just read off like which, what each scenario is? So it's like starting with the first one, 2.8% in facilities, what that represents? Is That's that basically my question. Yeah. Sure. Like, there's stories behind all these. I can't make any decisions based on the pie charts, although I do love pie charts. <laughs> but we, I need to know what like the 5.5 FDEs, here are the possibilities. I need the qualitative stuff to make any decision. And based on the pie charts, I don't have any direction to. Can, I'm not going to go into detail around people's positions because each one, like I won't, I'm not going to go into exactly what the position is for each of those because there's a person behind that position that could cause undue stress yeah. and yeah. I don't want to cause that. So I can say FT, F5.5 FTE across the district. That's great. That's better than 60 or whatever right. percent. Right. <laughs> but right. also you said that there's declining enrollment at UES, which we knew about, and yeah. that we did a reduction in force, a, a RIF, last year in the budget, and that it was sort of the writing was on the wall to probably do another one this yes. year. And so that's a that's something that we already sort of were we know. grappling with. Yeah. And then you said there might be some retirement. So if people retired, there would be savings there, and that would be in that included in that 5.5? Yes, and we are offering a retirement incentive to our AFSCME union members and our, hopefully, MREA union members. But Joe and I haven't actually come to agreement on that yet. So we're, we're, we've offered that for the last couple of years. So Joe and I are talking about that tomorrow. And then I think, would you be able to tell us if they were like, instruction position you know like jill said I'm not gonna go there because yeah. they're all over the place right and and every every position we have i would say is an important position yeah and it's somebody who works very hard in that position so it's about 5.5 ft across our district is what 65 percent yeah scenario one yeah okay. and then what are the salary and benefits for idea two what what does that slice of the pie represent i still have this question about I have a salary and benefits question in general, but I can wait till you do pie two or whatever. But I want to go back. Do want to go through the pie charts and yeah. again? I think. Okay, so yeah. if I'm sticking in idea one there, um, I can share my screen again. Yeah, that would be great because then the folks at at home can see it too. Okay, so if I'm on idea one. Again, salary and benefits there equals um, around 5.5 positions. Some of them we've known, as Emma just pointed out. Some, um, some may be from retirement savings. Um, and, and others the administration has kind of prioritized, just thinking about the situation that we're in. Uh, facilities equals about $22,000. That would probably be, as I said earlier, kind of room, a couple of room re renovations that we do every year. Um, they just wouldn't be done. We'd save that money. We just wouldn't do it. 
in terms of transportation that is mainly the Roxbury late bus and the Roxbury after the Roxbury Village School after school bus which has low ridership as the board sees in the policy monitoring document on transportation tonight um, and then the increased revenue is approximately $200,000 from the fund balance that is in addition to the $400,000 Christina is already um, or the board I guess is in, already encumbered for FY25. There's a bus that leaves the after school program? Is that what you mean? No, after school is out, you know, in between after school and school. There's very, there's consistently low ridership on that. When on school ends. When school ends to so take kids that, home. This doesn't include the ones, the one that brings them to school, but no. it includes the one that would bring them home at the end yes. of the day because maybe some of them stay, probably most of them stay at the after school It's program. a very low ridership. Because yeah. the after school program in Roxbury is extremely important. <clears throat> I mean, and not for our budget, not for these purposes, but for families in Roxbury, it's a big deal. That's what I mean. Yeah. <clears throat> there's low ridership in the after school bus, or afternoon bus. Libby, can you give the amounts in money for transportation and salary and benefits? Two hundred for transportation and a little over five hundred and twenty-one thousand for salary and benefits. Well, uh, sorry, what Is was the Jill salary math? again? Uh, five hundred and twenty-one thousand six hundred. Anyone feel free? Thank you. Is this the time to ask a question about salary and benefits, or do you want me to wait? Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. So. Um, I'd like you to talk about buyout, and I don't know like how beneficial that is to a district, except I do know that you can, for a fee, you can get rid of a very high salaried person. You can encourage a person to retire. My goodness, we lived in the district for many years and offered their blood, sweat, and tears to us for many years. Yes, Lynn? <laughs> but I don't know about the, um, you know, how actually beneficial it is to a district in the short run to do that. So by our numbers, um, it is a little bit more beneficial in the long run, you're correct there. But by our numbers, if everyone took the buyout deal that we offer to MREA and AFSPE, then we were talking approximately $100,000 of savings this year. Okay. And how many positions is that? I mean, you had to guess something to get that number right. Yeah, I don't have that right in front of me. And is that on the table as an option? AFSME has already agreed to the, the thing. And as I said, I have a meeting with Joe just tomorrow to talk about the one to MREA. Um, knowing my colleagues in the MREA, I don't know if we'll get that kind of Enthusiasm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kristen has a question. She's. Oh, we no, can't no, see it. Hi, Ben. Oh, no. Thanks, Brett. Yeah, I have my hands up. Sorry, I'm Kristen. Sorry, I'm not in the room. It's really challenging not to be there tonight, um, but uh, that's just reality for me tonight. So uh, I just wanted to get um, clarification. The decrease in transportation idea one by 6.9% involves the the Roxbury, the RDS bus that takes kids home at the end of the school day. Is that what I heard? Yes. Okay, and that's the only thing that's within that 6.9% or 55,200? Nope, in addition to the late bus from Montpelier to Roxbury. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, one thing that did just come up for me is, you know, Rhett mentioned that we have a very high value after school program and that is the reason, I think the primary reason why uh, we have such low ridership at the end of the school day currently. Um, and then also my understanding is it, uh, you know, the, the after school program is being currently run via a outside grant that is only through the end of this school year. Um, and at this point, we don't have a known funding source to continue the after school program next year. And I think what we've heard from part two, who um, offers the program in Montpelier, that RDS isn't considered a viable site for them. So that's just something I would certainly want to keep in mind that that bus would likely become extremely relevant if there's no after school program at the school. Yes. 
the other the other idea for an after school program at RBS is that it could run as it is now, but it, parents would have to pay for it. Parents currently don't have to pay for it. So the revenue would offset the costs. Yep, got it. Thank you. Uh, and then just as a follow-up, I think it, it could be helpful um, being somebody who's um, who's you know online, and I think we're all hearing a lot of chicken scratch on our um, on our computers and paper. If after this meeting, is it possible for us to get these ideas kind of with these more built-out um, uh, details in terms of cost and um, just specifics? so that we can really sit with this over the next seven days. I'm going to say again that I really hesitate to do that because then things become um, etched in stone in people's mind, and that's how misinformation spreads. So I want to reiterate that these are just ideas of what a kind of um, spreading of cuts in, ex in revenues could look like. Um, and that's really what we need from the board, is an idea of where to look at. To look more in facilities, to look more in transportation, to look more in salaries, where would we look the most, you know, that kind of thing. And then I feel safe offering this up because you've mentioned it so many times. Any board member could do a follow-up conversation with Libby. Because we are the ones who are going to need to be giving this direction in a week, any board member between today and oh, yeah. next Wednesday could have a follow-up conversation with Libby to be like, walk me through this one more time. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> if I move to idea two. Can I just ask one, I have one more question, sorry. Has there been any calculus in terms of what the cost of the after-school program would be and the, the cost to families? Yes, there has, but I'm, I w I'm gonna hold off on that, Kristen, because that's not the purpose of this meeting tonight. Understood. It just feels definitely connected to, you know, in terms of access and uh, how how necessary that bus becomes. If, if it's a prohibitive cost, which I imagine the effort would be uh, that the cost would not be prohibitive, but it certainly seems connected to, um, you know, the, the value of the bus at the end of the school day. Yeah, we understand that. And we've done that math. We're just not prepared to share it today. Um, okay, so in idea two, the increased revenue is the same. It's approximately $200,000 additional to the $400,000 we've already planned. Transportation would be smaller, so what that transportation slice represents is, is just the late bus from Montpelier to Roxbury. And then the salaries and benefits would be greater, and that, that looks at approximately um, eight positions. Um, seven positions, seven, eight positions, and is also starting to look at things like clubs and, and co-curriculars uh, to do that large slice. Not all, not all of them, not all of them obviously, 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 but some, some of them, them, yes. What does it mean to look at clubs and co-curriculars? Like there wouldn't be a position available to oversee the club or the co-curricular? Right. Um, on the salary and benefits, um, I know that you can't do details, but could you just say if you're envisioning, like, if it includes uh, a classroom teacher versus an administrative position, you know, non-classroom teacher, um, that's the dif differentiation that I'm interested in. The this would have a potential cut in non-unionized positions and unionized positions. Is that true about the other one too? Yes. Um, are, are unionized positions classroom teachers? Yes. Okay, and what's the balance? Also, uh, there so are instructional assistants are unionized, custodians are unionized, technology integrationists or technology people are unionized, uh, administrative assistants, all of those positions are unionized. Yeah, most, most of the folks in our building are unionized. We have actually very few people who are not unionized. Who's not unionized? Administrators, um, certain people like the people who work in Christina's office. Anna is not unionized. Heather's not unionized. So there's there's other people around. Oh. Hmm. There are very few of those. I, don't know, I feel like I'm like asking you to say something that you're not allowed to say or something, but like. Um, 
I don't have the exact number you're looking for. Oh, okay. So, so I like I, I can sit here and figure it out, but I I would rather not. I'm not prepared to do that tonight. Okay. So I don't I know exactly what you're asking me. I, I don't have that information exactly because this is a large <coughs> chunk, and we haven't dug like for idea two. We haven't dug that far into it. Okay. At some point in the budget process, like once we sort of give you a nod in one yeah. direction or another, you're going to be presenting numbers that do show yes. a little more detail about yeah. like which positions would be cut, like if it was at UES or if it was at middle school, if it was a classroom teacher or, right? You, you hear them based on the unionized category, right. not the building necessarily, but sometimes it matches. And at that point, if there was some huge red flag for the board <coughs> and that we disagreed with, there would still be time to change that. Yeah, yeah. in draft, okay. in draft point, number Emma. one, Good point. <coughs> you will see the, the yeah. bulleted list um, done in, in in the language that they're they're called in the contract. So I personally feel comfortable with more broad strokes in terms of the information that we're getting tonight. 5.5 FTEs. It's across the board. Some of it is retirement. Some of it is you know classroom teacher where enrollment is low. And then in the next iteration of the present budget presentation, we'll have more information that we can then. You will. Yeah. That's a good yeah, point, Emma. Yeah. Thank you. And that's the idea. And I think not to about a project, what I think is in Libby and Christine's head. <laughs> but I think that these are kind of, I think they have rough sketches of where some of these cuts are going to come from, but don't have the exact details. And I don't think are prepared to share the exact details for a variety of reasons. One, I, I'm not sure they've totally settled on them. Two, as soon as you start to throw out things that get specific, then, you know, we get in the situation I think we were in last week, like, oh my God, they're doing X. Yeah. And um, when I'm talking about reductions in force, I keep mentioning Joe, not just because he's in the room, but Joe is the union president, and I will have those conversations with him and with Corey Pulsifer, who's the instructional assistant union president, and Catherine Nunnally, who's, you know, like I will have those conversations prior to that information becoming public, because the community is not the first to know that, right? The people who are yeah. most affected is the first to know that. So when you say when you say clubs and co-curriculars, the there's those are those are there's an extra like let's say we have a Quidditch Quidditch club, <laughs> and would th this Please would be not. Please don't give any ideas. We would we would we would we would not be paying Professor McGonagall to coach the Gryffindor team <laughs> right. for the we would Quidditch be club. McGonagall's cycle okay. away. Yeah. Right. Oliver Wood would have to do it on his own. I think he could do it. That's the most relatable analogy I've heard. <laughs> yeah. You're right on. <laughs> so I think we're on the 25% increase revenue, or no, we're down lower. 18% so facilities. <clears throat> yeah, so if we go to uh, number three. So 18% facilities <clears throat> would be, again, renovations in classrooms. It equals out to. Approximately 140,000. <laughs> Could be 44 with my chicken scratch. Um, we'd also be deferring maintenance there. But again, not things that are within the capital plan. Right. Yeah. Things so, that, that are the regular budget pays for. Yes. yes. The local <laughs> budget. Yes. Can I ask a really quick question yeah. about facilities? Sure. Whatever happened, was there ever infrastructure ESSER money? Or is that old news now? You mean the infrastructure like, bill that was supposed to okay. come, that was yeah. promised to us yeah, and mm. promised to us? That is not coming. Okay. That yeah. is not coming okay. to fruition. Sorry. Um, the salaries and benefits, you know, for, obviously it's about 50%, so it's about $400,000. It's back to the same kind of thing, we're, same kind of idea that we we're in from idea one um, school-based budget so each principal is in charge of a school-based budget so that 4.4 percent would be about ten ten thousand dollars coming off the top of any school-based budget so principals would be ch in charge of figuring out what that means um, Roxbury's would be five per five thousand dollars instead of ten thousand dollars because their school-based budget is much smaller and then the transportation the big chunk in the transportation would be Roxbury's late bus, uh, the bus, total bus at Roxbury Village School, as well as Main Street Middle School transportation. 
So it would be moving back <coughs> to, for Montpelier, it would be moving back to where we were when I took this job. Five years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. Montpelier res student, Main Street Middle School transportation, Roxbury students would still get, have a bus. To, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To yeah, Main yeah, Street. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And deferred maintenance potentially has serious consequences down yeah, the road. Cost down the road. Yeah, cost. So yeah, exactly. unlike some of these transportation cuts, which continue to be sort of helpful in the next couple budgets, that one comes can potentially deferred maintenance, That's the specific point. aspect of the facilities part would potentially come back uh, to hurt us more. Yes. Within the five years, even yeah. potentially. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It's one of those things like with transportation, you can, you know, stop busing middle school kids, and then, you know, if uh, the financial situation changes in five years, you can start busing them with no cost. If you don't do that, like, $10,000 repair and, like, the rot spreads, it could become, like, a $70,000 repair in five years. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, in the, t in the, Two, first two ideas, we've got an, an additional, the increased revenue exists, and it's an additional 200000 from fund balance to um, basically general budget. It's not in the third idea. If we're talking about $800,000, there is the option of saying the board could vote to unencumber the money for the, to update the track and use a little less than half of it to fill this hole. It's, a, it's, it's something we could decide to do. Yes. But we probably don't want to do that just in year one. Right. Because it gone. would be, re then it's gone. Yeah. We don't get to use it again. It's sort of like the inverse of what <laughs> Rhett just said. Yeah. Whereas if we do deferred maintenance, then the costs are creeping up. But if we throw a bunch of savings, at the, if we throw a bunch of money at the problem right now is basically use up our savings then we can't do it when we no longer have that 5% cap. So I'm would, guessing that's why that's not <coughs> I would, option four. Well, <laughs> well, the two reasons. One, the board hasn't given me the direction that that's possible because that money's encumbered right now. Right, right. right. Um, and two, I firmly think that there's going to be a tax increase in five years, some sort of cliff, if you will, in five years. And we're going to want to have that money available to strategically use it then. 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 Yeah. Right. Can you explain why, if we were to, so it's two things, and I hate when I get garbage mouth and say too much because it dilutes my points. But first of all, if we're looking at one budget at a time, because we can't predict what the circumstances are for the next year's budget, then it's tough. I don't know how to make a four-year plan, number one. Two, um, why is it that if you cut something like 800000 to a $1 million, essentially, in a year-by-year -year basis, that you would be looking at a cliff at the end of the five years? Because we're starting in a $2 million hole. And the 5% cap goes away. Yeah. I'm still. Yeah, it's the other thing to consider. Exactly. And Jake, jump in here. Really hard to wrap your head around. Uh, jump in here if, if you think I'm saying something wrong, please, to correct me. So my understanding is that as, we, as of right now, with the information we know right now, and I know just enough to be dangerous about the revenue sources that go into the education fund. Okay, I do not know all the things that go into the education fund or all the possibilities the legislature could use to make sure the education fund is solid. Jake probably knows that way better than I do. The, as the education fund is being used for more pupils, because there's more weights, and for this five-year hold harmless kind of clause that they put in there, right? So we're, we're not the only districts that's gonna be using more of that education fund. <clears throat> Lots of districts around the state will be. The education fund could potentially, unless there's some action taken, start to deplete. When there's less money in the education fund, the dollar yield continues to drop, which is what you saw between last year and this year. And so when the dollar yield drops, taxes go up. 
So right now we haven't, we being superintendents and boards, quite honestly, have not been given reasons to believe that that education fund will be um, solidified in some way through legislative action, which I believe is the only way it can be. Things can be changed through legislative action. Is that accurate, Jake? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So we, we don't know what that could be. That could happen, right? In order to keep the dollar yield kind of stable, right? Which would be delightful. Which, that's what we want. And when we met with legislatures, Jim, me and I, that was one of the things that we talked to them about was that we need your commitment to stabilize that ed fund to stabilize the dollar yield. Like that's what we need you to do right now. Um, and so without understanding how the legislature is going to do that, however, I need to assume for our on, our, on your behalf, that the dollar yield is gonna continue to to drop, which means tax, that's the other factor in the five-year cliff, right? It's not just our general budget that's gonna influence it. The dollar yield is gonna influence it, which could be much lower than it is now. The other thing that's gonna influence it is CLA, and I'll look to Jill this time for CLA accuracy, is that CLAs are done every 10 years-ish. No. No? What is it? Year. Reappraisals are done. Reappraisals. reappraisals, thank you. Reappraisals are done every 10 years-ish. Montpelier's reappraisal was just done. Mm -hmm. So five years from now, we will be halfway through that reappraisal, which we can assume will decrease. The CLA will decrease right. across yeah. the five years. That's and so that is also when the CLA decreases, taxes increase. That is another factor that, that all of those will be in play that we, it's another reason why when Emma says, I wanna see numbers like that, like it's another reason why we can't predict it because I can't predict what the dollar yield and the CLA are gonna do. Is that accurate? My tax experts at the table? <laughs> I'm the only superintendent, by the way, who has not one, but two tax experts at the table. Lucky. <laughs> really quick, I just, there's been a couple folks asking about like the four years, five years looking, and I think what we do have, I do think depending on which idea we levitate to, gravitate towards we are picking a lane a bit right so if we if we w w the positions that we would would end up being cut are not going to come back next year the transportation is not going to come back so i do think we do have that level of like for what the, knowing what we do know we are going to have to make that kind of lane we're not going to want to do well this year we'll do this and then next year we'll do something else like i do think that is kind of us taking a step because we're not going to get back in the coming few years, whatever we do cut this year. That we do know. Thanks. Do you have another question? Hi, hello, can you hear me? Uh, we're not hello? doing, we're not, yeah, we're not doing public comment yet. We'll get there in just oh, a minute. Oh, you, and you actually said you were gonna do that quite a while ago, so I'm eager to do that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I, I know that, um, yes, we wanted to have the board decision. Are we ready for public comment? Any, I just, any I more? just heard Brett say he had two things, and I wasn't sure if he got through okay. both of them. Well, I mean, the first thing is, it's just an observation. From what you're saying, you can only do it year by year. Uh, and as we, like Jill just said, if we, you know, the savings from the, the transportation cuts, if we choose them this year, will essentially be there next year as well. And so, you know, it's, and, and it's a year by year thing. And like, you, you, it's hard to, you. <clears throat> and yet the FY26 budget is gonna get compared to the FY25 budget, looking at, did you increase it by less than 10%? So every year we have to make sure we pay attention to that number. Per people spending. Per people, per people spending. spending, thank you, thank you. And the decrease in spending from X from one or the decrease in pupil count in the district from 127 applies at when no. because for FY25 okay okay so good yeah so the biggest hit is now but it continues to be there <laughs> or an FY30 yeah. <clears throat> when the cap goes Chris, so I think we have some relative clarity on what these numbers mean in a rough sketch sense. Let's open it up to the public. Um, how many people in the room want to comment? 
One, two, three. How many people online? Please use your raise hand function. One. Nancy. Two. I see a physical hand. Just, just two anymore? There's a decent amount of people. Okay. So five people total. People um, can change their minds later, but that's, this is a okay. good, good number. Yeah. That looks like a hand. Uh, so, so three, and I'm just going to guess that two or three might also jump in. Um, try to keep to around a minute. Uh, if you go, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to keep strict time, but I, I will watch time. And if it if it starts to drift into um, long land, I, I will probably give you some sort of signal to wrap up. All right. And, and please introduce yourself um, uh, by name. Yep. Folks, I'm Jim Eikenberry, Montpelier resident. <clears throat> Going to be fast as I can. Um, so number one, you were looking for directions. Stay under the 10% cap. I think we just have to be fiscally responsible, even though none of us want to do any cuts. That's just, we're all adults here. It stinks, but we got to do it. Uh, two, I think we need to support the unions, and I like the idea of it, looking at incentives for retirement. So if somebody voluntarily wants to move on to something else in life, great. Um, but if we could avoid, you know, um, other avenues um, that would affect staff, I think we should try to avoid those impacts. Uh, two, maybe it's a process thing, but I know that our geography as a more urban school and then Roxbury's more rural school kind of mess with how the legislature came up with their numbers and weighting. GIS exists, there's great folks who work for the state who can break down the geography of Roxbury and the geography of Montpelier. Let's nudge them and see if they can do that and if that might actually get us a little bit of a benefit in our student count. Um, why not ask, right? It's, it's not hard to recognize that Roxbury is a rural school and there are some weights that should go to those, those kids. So let's, let's fight for it and get every dollar and maybe save ourselves some, some cuts if we can. Um, obviously, you all know I support the track. Uh, it's a huge um, benefit to our students and to the social emotional learning that we know they need and that that's where we've had learning loss in our district. Let's not forget that. Um, um, what I know won't affect your current thinking, but what I hope we can survive the triage of this budget and then think for the next budget is what are other sources of revenue that are out there? Let's form a subcommittee. Let's come up with crazy ideas. Um, you know, there's friends organizations for national parks, there's foundations, God only knows, but let's, let's go at that so that we can survive years, you know, two, three, four. Um, so that's it, and thanks again. Thank Take you. care. Thanks, thanks, Jim. Jim. Thanks, Jim. Hi, I'm Tina Muncy, and I just want to thank you because it's a hard go. <laughs> and it's not gonna get any easier. So I appreciate what you're doing. And actually, I want a ray of sunshine because I was just thinking that this is very exciting. Uh, the administration knows I love a plan. And so after, the, um, after you get through this year, and you're gonna get through this year, then you're gonna have to think, I was thinking of Emma's question and Rhett's questions about the next few years. And I love this in that that's the way you can do it, is make some decisions about where are you going to take the money you need to take. And it's a big, I mean, you'll trust the administration of how they will do it in that category. But I like the idea of going forward to say, after you get through this budget, then we'll look at the long range plan of, even though we don't know the figures exactly, we know we're going to have to do something and we can cut or determine where we're going to get that in this, in this sort of category. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you again for all you do for our kids. Great. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Tina. Uh, Joe. Hi. Joe Carroll, uh, MRA president, resident of Rock, um, Montpelier. Um, thank you all. I want to invoke Article 10.3 of our negotiated agreement, which kind of empowers the association to meet with the board to discuss the need for RIFs. And I think um, once you all have that lane picked out, you know, lane one, two, or three, I would be very eager to see that happen. And I think the best way to do that would be to meet with my um, uh, MREA board leadership 
So I, I, whenever that happens, I would love to kind of make that official by email or doodle polls. Whenever that happens, I think it would be really helpful to continue the collaborative clarity vibe that I think y'all are really interested in doing. So thank you. Yeah, no, thank, thank you, Joe. You, Joe. And, and we, we would invite that. And, and just, you know, it looks like you know, we will likely have to go down some sort of scenario with salary and benefits. And we absolutely want to do it the, the way that that's, um, has the least impact to the least people. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Um, that, that's it for the room. Uh, online, uh, I see Lisa Burns has her hand up. And if other people could just raise their hand, we'll just Patsy. go. Nancy, I think her name is. Um, why don't we do Lisa, then Nancy. Uh, and I saw a couple other people with their hand up. And oh, uh, Lisa, are you muted? We can't hear yeah, we you. We can't hear you. Indeed, I was muted. I was uh, say thank you, and especially thank you to Mia for bringing up the elephant in the room of the track. Um, currently, or, or last year, our special education got a F in the independent audit. 44% of our kids can do math. Um, you haven't closed the door on closing Roxbury School in the next five years. It sounds like that's on the table. You're cutting busing. You're talking about cutting five to eight uh, staff. And it just strikes me, and, and um, Ms. Boneseal, you just said that you want to uh, that tax cliff that's coming in five years, you want to have that uh, money available, not spend it all this year so you can use it to help with the tax cliff. The simple point would be um, you have $1.9 million sitting there for a track that a year ago the lowest budget was 2.3, uh, I think, or 2.4 million since the site has flooded. I wonder if any of you would just consider that maybe if you have to balance educational quality, cutting teachers, cutting buses, uh, cutting whole schools, um, if it might be reasonable to consider cutting the track as well, because though um, our previous speaker points out that it definitely benefits the 30 high school students who tend to run track, and the middle school students that come over, um, I think more children will lose much more by losing teachers, losing transportation, losing schools, and so on. So I would just wonder if anyone is considering actually defunding the track and putting that money to not only help right now with our school, but also with the tax burden. Uh, I look forward to the answer. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. Nancy Bruce. Uh, Nancy Bruce. For some reason, we just have. Well, it's just the. Yeah. Yeah, and I just want to clarify that what Libby was proposing was keeping the money currently allocated for the track, basically holding it and then using it in five years to mitigate a tax cliff. We're, we're not talking about building a track. <clears throat> we're not saying we're not going to, but we're also certainly not moving forward with it this time. We're, our idea is to keep that money on hold um, and use it in the wisest way possible. But in the end, that would be a board decision. It would be absolutely be a board decision, yes. Yeah. I think. Um, but, but 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 spending it all now is not going to avoid everything we talked about for the next five years. Right. So yeah. we have more public comment coming. More up. public comment. I, I just want to make sure there's not any misconceptions <clears throat> coming out of this meeting. Um, Nancy. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Loud and clear. Okay. Thank you, board. Wow, you've got a lot on your plate and I really, I can't imagine all the hours that you're putting into this really hard work. And I'm just gonna just quickly go through a couple of things that stuck out for me when at the beginning of the superintendent's presentation where um, she, they mentioned about 
being counseled to use drastic numbers for that first presentation. I'm not quite clear the context or maybe it's even moot at this point, but that's something that was um, really present for me. The other thing too, is that the other folks that are not unionized uh, in the district are food service people. So they are um, included in the non-unionized um, employees of the district. So um, the other, so listening to all of these numbers that I, there's, I wonder if the board actually has an understanding of the median income of Montpelier residents, not, not the average, but the median income, meaning where everybody falls, the, the vast majority of incomes fall in this small town of ours. And if you're talking, I mean, I'm on a fixed income, so you're talking about a tax increase, that that's huge. And so your your enrollment is declining, then you're talking about a tax increase. Have you also put that into the equation that you're going to lose more families as a result of this projected tax increase? Because we're maxed out. You know, we are so maxed out. And where I want to go, and I really appreciate the point that Lisa brought up about track, you know, co-curricular, extracurricular versus academics. It feels to me right now with the inflation pressing so hard on working class families, we want to educate our children. We want a solid education for our kids. Golf lessons, ultimate fris you know, frisbee, tennis, that's great. But have those things also been put on the table? And I know that that means someone's job. I understand that it is not easy. But I'm asking you all to just, well, as you've already done, um, just hear, hear my thoughts and opinions and, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. And I think we had Paul, and I think we had one other person as well, but I see Paul's hand up. Um, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Hi. Um, so I would just um, suggest that perhaps the uh, transportation to the middle school might be an easy one to put on the list. Um, as uh, the superintendent said, it's a relatively new benefit to um, to the community. Um, I hate to speak like an old fogey, but um, we did. Um, a lot of us lived through a lot of years um, taking kids to school at the uh, at the middle school. We survived. Uh, seems like it's a much better option than uh, some of the option other options you're looking at. I know it's not going to get you all the way there, but um, hopefully the uh, pie charts one, two, and three can sort of be combined. Um, I don't know that I'm endorsing the entire pie, pie chart in which that was an option, but sort of a, uh, a mix and match um, scenario. I would think that that would be one of the things that would be uh, easy to put on the list. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Paul. Thank you. And I think we had one other person at least to... Angela. Uh, Angela, yes. Sorry, we're not allowed to use Zoom at school, so I'm unfamiliar with it. So my apologies for the weird reactions <laughs> with the hands and stuff. Um, so I, I wanted to respond, I think... It was Jim, maybe it's hard to know all the board members at this point, um, who said, and as a teacher, this resonates with me, um, that you'd rather have students walk than lose a position, which I understand, but our Roxbury students don't have that option. Um, and geography limits them a lot. Um, the late bus doesn't currently bring students to the community, it brings them partway. It brings them like halfway back to the community. So that idea that um, they can have the bus to get to school so that you have 
the per pupil numbers, you have the butts in the seat, but not get them home is problematic. So I just want to make that clear and wonder, I just, sorry. Okay. I, the connection that my kids make because they're able to stay after school is critical for their mental health and just their connection to the community. And it just feels like a huge equity issue that our small community, like we merged and I understand that it was an unconventional merging situation. And I understand all of the components that make this a challenging situation, but it just feels like they're not treated the same. And that equity issue keeps coming up for me. And they feel when they come home discriminated against because of where they live. So I really urge you, I hear all the numbers and I hear all of that. I get it. But they're real human people in this situation that need the transportation in order to have the connection with their peers, in order to contribute. And they're contributors. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about the numbers. There are people behind them too. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Angela. Do you have any other folks online? Gallery. All right, well, thank you, everyone. That was very, very helpful and very thoughtful. Um, do we need more discussion time, or do we think we have what we need to come back? Remember, this is an iterative process, and this is step one. Um, Okay. Um, what's involved in the school-based budget? What's covered in that? Lots of things. Um, <laughs> different like department department budgets, furniture budgets, um, some um, like stipend money, like summer work money. Um, what are the other big buckets, Christina? And those field trips. Field trips. Mm -hmm. It's like anything a principal needs to run the school that's not a district-wide expense. Does that make sense? That's very specific to that building. Yeah? Supplies, yeah. And is 10,000 per school and 5,000 at Roxbury the biggest you think that could go? Mm -hmm. Well, no. Right <laughs> <laughs> well, my principal <laughs> sister yelling at me. <laughs> None of them are here today. Well, Julie, Julie's you there. You get it's me there. Like oh, I'm <laughs> They're texting. Right. I'm sorry. So I again. said if 4% of it is 10,000. No, it's 10,000 per school. Oh. With 5,000. That is on. Zoom. I just want to point out that yeah. some of yeah. them are here Shannon, today. No, Shannon I know. I'm Shannon. I was and kidding. Jason is also watching. I know. <laughs> I was kidding. So I think it was maybe Paul who suggested that there's idea one, two, and three, but but in reality, it's going to be mixing and matching. Just a way to give the board an yeah. idea. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And, and we can do that to six. We can kind of you know come back and say, well. Some combination of one and three is kind of working. You can make your own pie chart. Yes. Yeah, you can make your own pie chart. Exactly. <laughs> Go for it, Jake. Jake's eyes. <laughs> I hate pie charts. Uh, Miriam. I have a question about the track money. Is the plan that we were discussing to leave the track money allocated for the track project with the intention of not building a track? but using that money to help with the cliff? Because I understand, I totally understand the need for that money. It just seems a little strange to leave the money allocated for that, and especially because of the importance to a lot of members of this school in particular of the track. I'm not saying we need the track. I understand the necessity of that money, but I think we would probably be better off communicating with the community our intentions of not actually building a track than leaving it 
leaving that money allocated. I, I agree with yeah. you, Miriam. I think that I completely 100% agree with you. And we've had this conversation, Jim and I have had this yeah. conversation. I think um, my, my thinking right now is that if we're not using that two million, whatever it is, 1.9 million or whatever, for this year's budget, let's be let's have that conversation. Get through this budget season, and have that conversation when we're done, because then you, then the board can spend the time to actually have the conversation, um, and not make it a rush decision because so many other decisions need to be made. Yeah, and, and remember, we have a facilities process going on right now too. I mean, we 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 may need to use that money yeah. to floodproof our basement, our basement or our current school. So. Uh, you know, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna have a lot of information at the end of the year just about what our facility needs are. And our facility needs, you know, unfortunately they're clashing with, with this process, but yeah, this this building came within eight inches of not being usable. Uh, and uh, I remember Jim. And, and the rains will come again. Um, so so we have to, yeah, we have to be cognizant of that. That makes yeah. sense. Thank you. Well, I, I do appreciate what she's saying, yeah. though. Like, Absolutely. It's disingenuous. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, very thoughtful. It is very thoughtful. Yeah. I, I think it's also reasonable to, well, I'm just optimistic, but to hold out hope that yeah. this is hitting Perfect. the state really hard, and it's not, not just folding not out right. the way people kind of yeah. thought it was, and that there's going to potentially be a legislative response or adjustment. That may occur. It's not necessary. It's not. It, it's it very. It's 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 very possible that there could be a legislative adjustment somewhere in here, um, and who knows? You know what I mean? Maybe Roxbury doesn't have to close, and there's a track. I don't know. I mean, I'm just optimistic. But like, I just think that <clears throat> you know um, that 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 there are always possibilities that 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 could happen. I do want to ask, is it possible to do a four-year plan when you have such in, in unknowable numbers? I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is that the only way to do it is year by year. <laughs> uh, I would just say that every year it's it's even hard to build the budget by January 1st because we're still getting numbers. Numbers yeah. are still changing. So to make any kind of estimates for two, even two years is really challenging. You just never know what's going to happen. So. I think the thing we can think about, however, is that right now, we, right now in this moment, we know that the commitment the board and the community has made to social emotional learning and mental health in this district, which is incredibly large, is working for our students and is necessary for our students. Like that wouldn't be a place I want to cut. We've put in place human resources around our academic intervention and remediation that we didn't previously have and that is starting to work and we are starting to see benefits from it for our kids. We don't want to go there. You know, like so there are places that personally as the superintendent I would argue and argue and argue to say we need to hold tight to these services for our kids um, so that we can we can get them all learning at grade level or higher. Um, and so, and there are certain human resources we need, there's systems we need for that to happen uh, that simply can't go away, right? So there's a line that I would draw around staffing <coughs> and benefits. Um, none of the positions that referenced, were referenced today are in those categories. <laughs> Does yeah. that make sense? No, so yeah. we can predict Fully that. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think that's something we need to think about is, oh, thanks, babe, is what do we, what do we hold true to as the people responsible for, for the education and, uh, and social emotional health of our students? Yeah. And, and I just want to add to that. I mean, kind of the way I'm thinking about it is, you know, we have some, I think, very distinct values and goals. We've spent a lot of time the last year you know, hashing those out. And I want to hold as true to those as we can, kind of given what we know, you know, trying to make these cuts as painless as possible, as true to those values as possible, realizing that we do kind of have to go year by year, and realizing that we do know 
what we do know right now over four years is to some degree we are not going to have the, the type of wiggle room we need. So how can we kind of responsibly year by year do what's best for next year without putting us in an obvious bind down the road? And, and I think it would be great to have you know, a four-year plan we could count on. I don't think we're going to have that. But I think we can kind of know that you know, this is not a one-year thing. It's a four-year thing. Each year, we're, we're going to probably have to make some tough choices, hopefully red is right and the legislature steps in and some other things happen and it you know that trajectory goes up but i but we we can know that you know let's stick true to our values let's try to be as responsible as possible let's you know make each year as painless as we can and as kid focused as we can without doing something that's really gonna you know put us in a, a, a bind, in an obvious bind down the road. And you can do a pie chart just really as guide rails. Percentage <laughs> yeah. as, as you find out the big yeah. Jim, just really quickly. Yeah. Um, I absolutely agree with, yeah. with, the, with the need to sort of take it one step at a time in a yearly process. And I do think there are some decisions in this year's budget that we can make that will have um, impact way beyond the, the next few years. You know, one example I'm thinking is to the the idea of incentives for those folks who are, who who may be ready to move on to the next yeah. step in their in their life. Taking money from the fund balance <clears throat> to pay those folks an incentive then helps us way more than yeah. the amount in the fund balance exactly. five years from now. Yeah. So those are the things that I think I'm hearing when people say like a strategy, like yeah. those are the things that I think are important. Not trying to project what the budget's gonna be in three years, but thinking about what are those lanes that we put ourselves yeah. in now that position us well for the future. Yeah. And Mike and Burr is 100% accurate of what other revenue sources can we yeah. find? Yeah. Can we pull in more exchange students who pay tuition? Yeah. Can we, you know, like there are, there are other, they're not many for schools, yeah. but there are other places that we can find revenue that we can put some effort into. Yeah, no. and, and you're totally right, Scott. I know Dick wants, wants to get in here. But you know, if we can find the cuts that don't that that don't cut to the core of what we want to do, as Libby was saying, don't don't undermine our successes, and create future savings instead of future costs. Jake. Yeah, I was just going to basically agree that um, using one-time money, um, we definitely want to use it for kind of like one-time applications and not to reduce ongoing expenses because it just puts you in a hole yeah. and that's actually what the situation the state is in this year and the education fund use of huge surpluses from the last two years to buy down rates really problematic so if we did do something like take you know unencumber the track money um, you know it, it would the only like application that's reasonable is like something major that's you know one time that's finite and not to buy down tax rates or whatever because that would just dig you a hole for the next year. Yeah. Um, and same with the reserve funds that we're looking at right now in the pie chart in yellow. <coughs> you know you want to be strategic with them. Yeah. yeah. Was that a hand? No. Yeah. Um, it's eight thirty-five. We've got a lot to think about. We've got two more meetings. Yeah, I just want to reiterate, we've, we've added extra meetings so we can keep this conversation going and make sure that we're at a good decision point. Um, so next meeting is, you know, give some thought. Again, you know, take this week, reach out to Libby if you have questions. Uh, you know, use it to get clarity. Uh, you know, this is not the end of, of question time. We'll come in on the 6th. We'll have a good discussion. We'll give them some direction. Then the 13th. We'll get more specifics. Um, and let's break for executive. Oh, let's do policy monitoring and then break for executive session. Do I have a motion to approve uh, policy monitoring reports B5, employee unlawful harassment, C3, transportation, and B4, drug and alcohol testing of transportation employees? I move to approve the three policy monitoring reports. No, second. I second. Any discussion? Uh, this is Kristen. Um, can you all hear me? 
Yeah, I just want to bring up some discussion around uh, policy C3 transportation um, and just, uh, you know, take take a look at the RBS late bus. I know that's been a topic of discussion tonight, and it's something that we might be looking at in terms of a cut uh, for next year's budget. Um, I know that there's, a, and I think everybody at this point received an email that came in from a community member out here in Roxbury. Um, I think, yes, indeed, the numbers show that we've had low ridership. I don't think that can be argued. Um, I think folks in the community um, have have contacted folks in, in leadership and um, kind of more recently have reached out to me uh, that the value of the bus would be hugely optimized and increased if the bus was to extend to the village of Roxbury. Um, so while we're seeing low ridership, I think there is sentiments and feelings that that ridership um, would change um, should the route be extended to, uh, to the village. Uh, so I just want to bring that up. I know it was an initiative that I very much, you know, put in front of the board and advocated for. And it was, um, you know, and, and Jim was present in the time of the merger. My understanding is, you know, that group did a lot of thinking and talking about how access to extracurriculars was going to be a key component of community building among the students, um, you know, of, of Roxbury and Montpelier. You know, we we're talking a lot about belonging and wellness. And I think as, as Angela said, you know, the ability to access um, sports and clubs and, and theater and things like that is, is highly valuable to students in their, in their wellness. So I know a group of Roxbury folks are coming together to just discuss and, and try to make some recommendations about how that current busing option could be optimized to increase the ridership. I don't think anybody wants to see us hemorrhaging $24,000 a year for no good reason, um, but I know folks are coming together to make some recommendations about how that bus could be better optimized. And just to be clear, increasing the route increases the cost because it's a per mileage cost. So there, it doesn't become $24,000, then it becomes more. So just to put everything on the table there. Wasn't yeah, that would be a great detail to understand. And then the driver, there was a driver, was a driver question as well. As well. Yeah. So. Uh, further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Um, do I have a motion to enter executive session for the purposes of personal I got it. Review? I got it. I move to enter executive session for the purpose of discussing the evaluation of the superintendent on the under the provisions of Title I, Section 313A3 of Vermont Statutes, the evaluation of a public officer. Uh, awesome. Do I have a second? All in favor? Aye. I right. motion to move into that. Okay, we already moved into executive session. So, so okay. um, we have Kristen who yes. needs to join us in a breakout room. Are you on Zoom? So I'm on we Zoom. Either put her on Zoom or we could call her, which is easiest. Do you have? Oh, okay. Uh, Anna, can you make um, Mia the co-host? And Orca can leave at this. Yep. Yes. Yep. Just, 